This part of the lecture series is going to be a portrait of St. Francis of Assisi. St. Francis of Assisi is widely regarded in the Catholic Church as the patron saint of ecology. He's a very interesting figure in his own right, and particularly for environmental studies, he is um, regarded as a bridge between religious views of the environment and interests in animal rights and so on. His life is not just an interesting um, picture of a saint, but is actually an important moment in the history of economics. Uh, he was born in 1181. His father, Bernardo, was a merchant, and he was involved at the very start of the a quickening of uh, economic activity it was associated with markets and markets there were market days that would meet in places like uh, Italy and in France and elsewhere and so um, Francis's father Bernardo used to go backwards and forwards to France and once when he was away Francis was born and that's why he was called Francis his father uh, named him that because of this time that he'd spent uh, in France now uh, at this particular moment, as I said, there's a, there's a quickening of economic activity and it's really the beginning of what would eventually end up being first mercantile and then f true full-scale capitalism, uh, a form of economics within which we currently live. And Francis is interesting because not only does it come at the beginning of it, but right at the very beginning of it, he is very, very suspicious of what's going to happen with economics and how it's actually changing the nature of people in the world in which he lives. Francis uh, was born in 1181. He lived in a place called Assisi, which was a small town in Italy. And his father was a cloth merchant. And when Francis was growing up, it was assumed that he would become a cloth merchant like his father. And at that time, there were also uh, conflict with uh, the Islamic world. The, there were the beginnings of crusades to the Holy Land. And um, Francis was probably a soldier for a year or two, clearly failed at that, and then became a kind of a, a wandering student. And finally, he had a spiritual convergence. And his spiritual convergence was focused particularly on passages in the Christian scripture where um, there are phrases like, take no thought for the morrow, God will provide, and one should, as it were, trust that if one truly believes in the spiritual life, that abundance will come to you, that there will be uh, enough for everybody, and so on. And Francis was taken with uh, this whole idea, and he decided that the way of showing that he truly believed in the Christian life and to believe in God was that he should um, get rid of everything that he had, all of the property that he was supposed to have and everything else, and rely on God um, if he believed in God, God strongly enough, that if he believed in God strongly enough, that God would find a way of providing, was a way of trusting in God. So one of the very first things he did um, to the uh, consternation and shock of his father was he went to his father and he said, uh, I'm actually going to be a spiritual person and I no longer want to be involved in any of your activities because it involves um, uh, money and markets and not fully trusting people and so on. So famously, in the town square in Assisi, just to really nail his father, he removed his clothing, his father being a cloth merchant, stripped himself down and walked away from the city square naked. And eventually he got some clothing and he got a series of, of um, disciples around him. People became really interested in, in Francis and what he was doing because it was such an interesting challenge. And also this, again, there was this idea of a deep belief. If you had a deep belief, in the, in the underlying abundance of things, then um, the Lord would provide. And it turned out that the Lord did provide, as I'll talk about in a second. Anyway, for the first um, few years of his uh, activities, he had, as I said, he had a group of people who began to start following him, they more and more. Um, they had nothing. They would get fed by begging, or people would start giving them uh, food. 
when they went to mass or to um, uh, engage in prayer, they did it outside, and then eventually they found their way into uh, small uh, ruined churches, of which there were some in the area, and uh, they would go and work for people in order maybe to get a little bit of food money, but only every day at a time. They wouldn't work for salary. They would make sure that every day they would have to start fresh again. And because Francis was the son of somebody who had spent a lot of time in France, Francis had a, a very strong um, feeling for music, and he began to compose songs of his own to Lady Poverty. Lady Poverty was the damsel who he was worshipping, and uh, he and his followers were well-renowned renowned for dancing in the streets, and they would dance through the roads and, and so on. They were living this free life, um, and this became more and more well-known, and uh, Francis became um, more and more involved in trying to turn this group of individuals into something um, more institutionalized. So he went to visit the Pope in Rome, and the Pope at that time, who by any real stretch of the imagination should have made him a heretic, didn't. One of the smartest things that the Church ever did. And they allowed him to institutionalize himself, and so they set up a, uh, a particular order, the Franciscan order, which would keep the rules of poverty and would actually follow the rules and ideals of the Catholic Church. So this, as it were, developed over time. As it developed, Francis became more and more uh, saintly. He began to do things like um, preach sermons uh, to animals, he, there's a famous sermon of the birds that he's supposed to have given. He seems at some point, and these are stories, whether they're true or not, they are, are ways of, as it were, painting him as an extraordinary figure. A figure who, because he didn't have any goods, he didn't have any property, seems, and he seems to have understood this, to have dropped a, a, torn aside a veil that keeps human beings and animals apart. And so, as I said, he would uh, give sermons to birds, to fish, to, um, he negotiated supposedly with a, a wolf that was terrorizing a town called Gubbio, and, and so on. He became this uh, extremely influential uh, figure. So influential that people started giving money to the Franciscans, which was exactly what they didn't want. But the Franciscans had become so well known for their lack of interest in money that, of course, they're the people who you want to give money to rather than people who've got a vested interest in spending it for themselves. And this caused a great tension within the Franciscan movement. At the beginning of the Franciscan movement, this hadn't been an issue. In fact, there's a well-known story of how he and his uh, group were almost starving, and a banker came to his group and said, I hear that you're starving. Is there anything that I can do for you? And Francis and his group huddled together, probably seriously huddled together, and somebody had in the bottom of a pocket, they actually had a, a little penny and they, Francis took the penny and gave it to the banker and, and said to him, you clearly need this more than we do, and sent him away. So Francis had a very um, strong concern about what money and property did to people coming from his own background. As Francis's life continued, this question about how an institution that was devoted to poverty could survive within the institutional church, and also how somebody who was so saintly, um, as Francis had become, could articulate what it meant to be um, in such a state. And most famously, um, Francis wrote a poem, uh, which was a kind of a, a praise and a homage to God, and in the course of doing so, also praises the world around him. As I said, one of the things that had happened to him was he'd sort of broken through to a kind of trust in the world and in all the creatures in it. And I'm going to read this poem. This is called The Canticle. This is Francis's Canticle. 
I'm reading it in English, and the canticle goes as follows. Lord Most High, Almighty Good, yours are the praises, the glory, the honor, and every blessing. To you alone, Most High, do they fittingly belong, and no one is worthy to mention you. Be praised, my Lord, with all your creatures, especially Brother Sun, who brings the day, and you give us light by him. He is fair and radiant with a great shining. He draws his meaning most high from you. Be praised, my Lord, for Sister Moon, the stars. In heaven you have made them clear and precious and lovely. Be praised, my Lord, for Brother Wind and for the air, cloudy and fair and in all weathers, by which you give sustenance to your creatures. Be praised, my Lord, for Sister Water, who is very useful and humble and rare and chaste. Be praised, my Lord, for Brother Fire, by whom you illuminate the night, and he is comely and joyful and vigorous and strong. Be praised, my Lord, for Sister, our Mother Earth, who maintains and governs us and puts forth different fruits with colored flowers and, pray and gra grass. Be praised, my Lord, for those who forgive because of your love and bear infirmity and trials. Blessed are those who will bear in peace, for by you, Most High, they will be crowned. And be praised, my Lord, for Sister, our bodily death, from which no living man can escape, and woe to those who die in sin. Blessed are those whom it will find living by your most holy wishes, for the second death will do them no harm. Amen. So as you can see, this is one of the reasons why Francis became the patron saint of ecology. He has a, a sense of the, not just the interdependence of all things, but they are somehow family, that the, all the things that we see around us, water, earth, fire, uh, are living beings or they have a relationship with us as if they were our family. At the end of his life, Francis um, wrote a final part of his testament, part of this canticle and other um, rules, and to try to leave to his uh, followers the rules of poverty and so on that he had started with. After his death, the problems started, and the problems had been mounting up already because of this strange way in which, although they had um, hoped to be in poverty and, tr and trust in the abundance of God, the abundance began to come from people all over Italy and all over the known European world to the Franciscans, as I said, because they seemed to be the only people who didn't really, really want it. So within 30 or 40 years of Francis's death, uh, a big church was built in Assisi. Other churches were being built um, with, uh, on, in support of the Franciscans. And um, the whole of the Franciscan order became swamped with large sums of money, which they had great difficulty figuring out what to do with. At the end of the 13th century, um, uh, a group of Franciscans called the Spiritual Franciscans once again argued that the original Franciscan ideals of poverty should be maintained. And they put forward an argument that the church itself should divest itself of all of its property if it was going to be a true church. This caused, as you can imagine, uh, difficulties with an extremely wealthy church and this trouble that had already happened with what to do with uh, with the um, monies that had been pouring into the Franciscan orders. And uh, they had a conference, and the conference was a conference about whether or not um, Jesus had property. And the um, people in the conference talked about whether or not who purchased the sandals that the, the disciples wore. There was, a, there was a bag of money that moved around with the disciples in Jesus' original teachings. And um, there were questions about who paid for the Last Supper and things like that. In the 1320s, the Pope of that time, John XXII, um, uh, sent out a uh, binding encyclical which argued that the church had a right to property, and not only did the church have a right to property, but people, ordinary people, had an inalienable right to property. He used the term inalienable, which has um, continued and has become attached from this particular encyclical of the Pope 
to the idea of everybody has inalienable rights. These are things that cannot be taken away from you. And he argued that Jesus had property, the church would have property, and that the Franciscan order would have to take that into account. And Franciscans since that time have, again, struggled with this uh, interesting tension and have created in many places institutions which would manage the money on behalf of Franciscans, but they themselves don't actually own any property. As you can see from this, there is a, a fine line here and between um, issues of abandoning property, about whether people should have communal property, about whether institutions should have property uh, on behalf of um, either religious or other activity and so on. And it comes from this extraordinary figure, this extraordinary radical figure at the beginning of the 13th century who um, not only was probably the first person in the Western tradition to really take the natural and animal world uh, as a spiritually significant area, but also at the very beginning of its reign um, raised interesting questions about the future of capitalism and what its spiritual burden was.